Um, my name is Sarah McIntyre, and I chose to do my presentation on the connections between um, the rhythmic elements of music and um, the receipt because obviously, as you'll see in the presentation, there's a lot of connections between the two, and I think um, it goes to show how using music in a reading classroom and reading in a music classroom can help kids build um, skills for both disciplines. So I started off with a quote from one of the studies that I've read, and it just kind of summarized. So the skills developed in music, uh, in a music classroom may take children far down the road to become better readers. So I have like a short introduction, uh, then we'll talk about the background and cultural importance of using music in a literacy setting. Uh, I have a couple of studies that will prove to be very interesting and helpful to me to claim, and then some connections as like a wrap up. And then I have a couple um, ways you can integrate this in your classroom, and then group discussion, yay. And then we'll just kind of wrap up with points of review. So to start, um, why choose rhythm to relate to reading? Um, and the rhythmic elements of music can be integral to deepening language building skills and comprehension. Supplementing a literacy education with music not only will bolster students' reading and language acquisition skills, but it will also provide them with an interdisciplinary approach to learning in all subjects. So using, um, using music in the classroom can be applied to like all subjects. You can use it to talk about science, you can use it to talk about math, you can use it to talk about reading. And then there was another quote in a book that I read. Um, Children should learn musical skills in much the same way they learn language skills. They should hear and perform before they read and write. Second, children must develop two generic skills at the same time, performance ability and the sense of music that tells them when to sing what. And so that's what we'll be talking about. Um, so we develop language in parts and we learn to read in parts. It's all, it all kind of follows the same general sequence. And um, this is similar to how we hear music in parts and how we learn about music in parts, but in language, this is called phonological awareness. So first, um, kids hear rhyming sounds. So like, you know, when you start off reading a book with a kid, you say, oh, the cat was at the place with the hat, you know, and they all rhyme and you start to pick up on those rhyming sounds uh, first. Then they learn about parts of a sentence, so like subject, verb, and all the rest. Um, then they start to hear parts of words, so like the syllables and blending sounds, and that's really where the rhythmic connection um, will show because syllables are rhythm just in words, and blending the sounds together to create those words um, with the beginning and ending in parts. And then parts and blending of individual phonemes so like synthesizing the letters together and eventually creating longer sentences and paragraphs. So this is shown in music through a very similar process. Um, so we start with audiation. Students can hear sounds in words and sounds in music. And then the approach. Uh, students will build upon their audiation skills through musical activity. So that's like in a classroom that would look like singing in a you know, a little group circle and using instruments to kind of just get um, a sense of beat and all those musical dimensions. Um, and then you have learning sequence activities where students will learn to um, audiate patterns that make up musical literature. So as I said, the musical dimensions will play in here and they'll, again, you can use instruments um, to talk about dynamics, rhythm, um, articulations and things like that. And then um, the synthesis at the end, they're able to piece together all this information to eventually perform a piece of music. Um, so in literature and music, rhythm is not just beat. Um, it's also like the space between sounds. So as I'm talking, there's also spaces in between my sentences that kind of give you a tone of what I'm talking about. Um, so that's like room for breathing and like syllables and words. There's all those kinds of spaces in between. Um, and then a music rhythm can also be uh, the space between notes, duration of notes, and differences in stresses. So like accents, staccatos, you know, all the other stuff. 
Um, so we can already see how there's a lot of similarities in rhythm and language. Um, so as we've all learned about in education classes, all children have a background in the arts and music, and it's really our job to utilize and hone in on that background and take what they know and use that to help them extend that into new knowledge. Um, so when you're teaching them songs or things like that, or how to read, um, using music can help because being able to hear words to a song and then hearing and reading the lyrics makes, um, makes it a lot easier. And listening to music allows students to form a deeper experience in language because they're immersed not only in the sound of your voice, but also the things accompanying your voice, like the background music, the beats, and they can hear more of the syllables of what you're speaking because you're speaking in notes. Um, so in, in rhythm and language, um, rhythm and tempo are the organizing principles of speech and language. Without these, there would be no structure to any language or speech. So take for example me right now. I'm speaking in a very like choppy sort of way, part because I'm nervous. And um, But if you were to speak in some sort of way, next time kind of like just think about how fast you're speaking, how slow you're speaking, if you're saying some words faster, or if you're saying longer words, like how are you kind of syllabalizing that out? I don't know if that's a word, but. Uh, and this has kind of been in development um, since the 1960s, so just kind of seeing connections between how children uh, learn music and how they learn to read. So, and, um, Uh, repetition, pausing, and speed of speech is something that linguists will heavily analyze uh, when studying languages of the past. And these are all obviously critical elements of rhythm. So if you hear somebody speaking French, they're going to speak in a different sort of rhythm than they would that I'm speaking right now. Or somebody speaking Spanish, they're all going to be different, but the unifying force is that they're all speaking in some sort of rhythm. Um, and the pauses in speech can act as a point of connection between the audience and the speaker, just as in music. So you all know when you're playing a piece or singing a piece with a choir or an ensemble and there's a huge tension moment and then all of a sudden it stops and, and the audience is like supposed to be on the edge of their seat like, oh my God, what's gonna happen next? You know, like that's, that's, a, that's a connecting point and it's um, how rhythm can unify the audience or the performers and the listener. And during speech, pauses also occur during times of stress and forgetfulness. Um, and in music, pauses occur during the similar moments as we just talked about. And especially in face-to-face -face interactions, this will happen a lot more because people obviously get more stress when talking to a group of people or like one person individually as if like compared to they were on a computer or like FaceTime or something. And as a last, a last kind of point for this, people uh, speak in tempos no matter what language they speak, so that shows how rhythm is a unifying force between all language. And for rhythm and music, rhythm is what turns unorganized sound into organized music. It provides a framework and a structure for us to hear patterns and sounds. Uh, oral traditions are often passed down through songs and chant. Um, for purposes of remembrance, like the ABC song, if you sing that in elementary schools, remember the ABCs. Um, music is obviously used for recreational purposes, uh, dance and just making your own music. Uh, music is used for unification, uh, chants, work songs, uh, songs for human rights, uh, all of those kind of unifying forces. <laughs> Uh, music is used a lot in religious purposes, which is also kind of like unifying for that group of people. And family purposes, like favorite songs passed down in tradition and all that. And there's lots, obviously, lots of repetition in music. And so using music in your classroom will uh, solidify words, letters, sounds, and melodies for your students, whether you're teaching reading or you're teaching music. And as we had talked about previously, music is sequential, and so is learning to read. 
So the music sequence, if you're thinking about like just a pop song, you have a verse, then you have a chorus, and you have another verse, then a chorus, then the bridge, then another chorus, and the list goes on. And the reading sequence kind of follows the same thing, building on those parts. You learn letters, then you learn words, then you put those words into sentences, and you put those sentences into paragraphs, and then you are like, oh, I have to read left to right now. So it all follows some sort of sequence that's based on like a pulse and a structure. So about um, a little bit of culture, it has been proven that speakers of any language tend to follow some sort of tempo when they talk, as I have said a couple times before, but that's kind of a main point. Um, and then what changes person to person though is the tempo that each speaker will speak at. So in music, that's the beats per minute. And in language, that's kind of like the syllables per beat or per word. And another change is the density in which people speak, which can be comparable to like the heaviness of the rhythms and the amount of rhythm in music. So some people will speak in quarter notes, or some people will speak in 32nd or 64th notes, which is basically talking slow or fast, or using a lot of words at once, or only using a few. And your tempo of speech will change depending on what kind of conversation you're having. So I'm definitely probably talking really fast right now, but I'm just not aware of it. And if I were to talk to, say, like a really little baby, I would be like, oh, hi, how are you today? You know, like my voice obviously changed a lot, went up higher, and I slowed down a little bit in my, in my speech. Um, so we, if we were to further analyze this, um, in our speech, we would find lots of rhythm stuff. Hemiola, you know, like that, like the syncopation. Uh, lots of rubato, so lengthening and shortening of sounds and pickups in our speech, so coming in off of the measure. And so that's kind of how we can trace rhythm as a unifying force between all languages across time, whether that's time in a person's life or time in the world. So now we have a group activity, yay. So we were talking about how your rhythm and tempo of speech changes when you're having different conversations. So a couple that I thought about um, is if you're talking, if you're a talk show host, like a radio show host, you're gonna talk a lot different than you were if you were having a dinner table conversation or if you're talking to a really old person and if you're talking in a library. So following this prompt, Turn to everyone in your tables and say this sentence as if you were talking to, or if you're talking to people and you were a radio talk show host. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, go do it, please. <laughs> Hello, my name is Kevin. How are you today? Like, like, uh, lovely weather. Uh, lovely weather. Uh, lovely weather. Hi, my name is Maddie. Hello. Hello. My favorite color is purple. Lovely white we're today. Lovely white I feel like I'm thinking of blue. Yeah, because I'm just gonna. Hi, my name is Nico. My favorite color is purple. How are you today? Lovely weather we're having. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, so now, now you're not radio talk show hosts anymore. You're talking to your family at the Thanksgiving dinner table while eating stuffing and trying not to get into the politics of today. <laughs> And you're reintroducing yourself to your own family. Go. I'm actually so pretty quiet. I told my family that we're having a lovely weather. I think they're looking at us for a My name is Josh. Oh, my God. How are you? Oh, my God. I think my name is Brian. My favorite color is orange. How are you? Lovely weather. My name is Josh. Hi. I'm Nico. This is Lauren. Oh, my God. How are you? How are you doing? Nice weather. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Maddie. My favorite color is purple. How are you today? Okay, Lovely now weather. you're having a separate conversation with uh, 95 year old Grandma Betty in the living room, and you're trying to 
Make sure she hears every word that you're saying. Go. Hey. Hey. Hello. <laughs> oh, I'm Brianna. Do you remember me? Hi. Okay. My favorite color is orange. How are you today? Aren't we kind of lovely weather? Hi. My name is Maddie. My favorite color is purple. How are you today? Lovely weather we're having. How are you today? Hi. And last, Grandma Betty is gone and home, and you went to the library to do all of the homework that you didn't do the last three days of break. And you're with somebody, and you're talking to them about your homework, but you're saying this sentence. Go. Okay, we're not at the library anymore. So let's talk about some of the differences in the ways we were speaking. So when you were a radio talk show host, what was different from that speech than Grandma Betty's speech? Anybody? What was different about those two kinds of things? Joanna. The radio talk show was a lot smoother and more confident, and speaking to Grandma Betty was loud and drawn out. Yes. And I heard a lot of repeating words and saying them very loudly and saying them very slowly, like, how are you today? And that followed some sort of rhythm compared to me as a radio talk show host. How are you today? Much faster <laughs> and compared to if I was talking to Grandma Betty. Did anybody else notice some other differences? Darren? Uh, I would say pitch and volume were both a part of that. Yes, so if you're talking to an old person, obviously volume is going to be a lot more than if you were talking in a library. And um, pitch is going to be a little different too. So if you're a radio talk show host, here's the prompt. Hi, my name is Sarah McIntyre and my favorite color is green. How are you today? Lovely weather we're having compared to... Hi, my name is Sarah McIntyre and my favorite color... And also, there were a lot more pauses in the quiet sentence because typically when we're whispering, we want to make sure people hear what we're saying. So we're going to pause more to make sure they have time to register all of that in their heads. So yeah. So there were a couple of studies that I looked at and I chose two to uh, show to you all in this presentation because I thought they were the most interesting and the most beneficial to the topic. So the study about the synchronizers and the non-synchronizers was conducted in the late 2010s and looks at how well kids aged three to five, so it was mainly kindergartners, can synchronize their own tapping to like a metronomic pulse. So they were given three scenarios, just passive listening to the metronome. Then they would tap with their right hand, not listening to the metronome. And then they would tap with their left hand to the metronome beat. Uh, the synchronizers were students who effectively tapped to the beat, and they later performed better than the non-synchronizers on different pre-literacy pre tasks, which meaning they basically had higher response times to um, the questions they were asked and the tasks they were given. So after the students listened to the beat, they were given a couple tasks. Um, what are those? They were given some tasks to do on this slide. So tests uh, relating to phonological awareness, um, auditory short-term memory, rapid automized naming, and music perception. Uh, there was rhythm and melody. So uh, the synchronizers of this study had their abilities reflected in the literacy skills and their auditory midbrain response to speech syllables. So in non science -y terms, this just means how fast and how much the brain was able to respond to speech. And the non-synchronizers were the students whose neural codings did not fire off fast enough to interpret the sounds, and therefore the response times to the questions they were asked and the task put at hand was shorter, and I just didn't write was shorter on the slide. 
So this is a really good visual representation of how the, the neurons were firing off in the student's brain. So the top right here is the synchronizer and the bottom is the non-synchronizer and you can very clearly see that they were responsive to the beat that they were given compared to the non-synchronizer who was sort of responsive to the beat. If you were up a little bit closer, you could see that there's some unification between all of these waves, um, but it's, very, it's much less clear. And this was just some data after the, um, the tasks were given to them. And then this one I thought was also really interesting. Um, so this one talks about phase locking, and phase locking is the ability of the brain's neurons to lock on to hearing and interpreting a sound. And as you can see, when a sound is played, or like a, in this case, the metriotic pulse, the synchronizer students uh, were able to lock onto that very clearly, which means they were able to tap their finger to the beat uh, with and without hearing it. And this is um, the visualization of the non-synchronizer. You can see that they're still able to kind of lock on to that, but it's not nearly as clear as uh, what it was with the synchronizers. So, and then in this study, groups of students were taught multiple lessons over multiple weeks about different song and word reading processes. So, the five different kinds of lessons that were taught in the sequence, uh, they learned children's songs, five little monkeys, five speckled frogs, ten in the bed, and upon a spider's web. Uh, in the next lesson, they read the lyrics to these songs, then they replaced the lyrics with similar sounding words in word families. So if you're unfamiliar, word families are words that sound the same in rhymes. So like cat, hat, bat, sack. And you typically teach these to kids like over multiple days because it takes them a little bit to lock onto it. So these lessons were kind of given in response to helping kids lock on to the word families. Uh, in the next lesson, the uh, Proctor gave students rhythm instruments, like uh, rhythm sticks, egg shakers, etc. So they could immerse themselves in the music and the rhythm. And then the last lesson, they rewrote the songs um, using different words from the word families. Um, and they used previously learned patterns to kind of rewrite the songs. So something I thought was really interesting about this project is that in the different activities that the person did, they wrote out the songs on sentence cards so the students could kind of like move them around and kind of reword them and color code them to put them with different ideas that were similar. Um, they also talked about the differences between a reading voice and a singing voice, which we did in the activities kind of just with different kinds of reading voices. Um, I like that they include rhythm instruments along with the singing because I feel that that's a really good experience for students to uh, have to put themselves in the words and in the music. Um, and music activities are mostly always hands-on and very student-centered because it allows the students to move around and communicate with their peers, not just through speaking, but through playing instruments too. Um, also in, and, I, and you'll see this in the next uh, slide or two, they, when they rewrote the songs, they used silly words and I thought this was a really good idea because it lets the students feel like they're creating their own original work without doing any of the boring seat work that children do, are not responsive to. Um, and then in the later lessons, students used rhythm sticks um, more specifically to identify syllables of each word. So in the study, on the sentence cards, they put dots above each like syllable and they clapped with the rhythm sticks to each syllable. Um, so this was an example of one of the lesson plans that I really liked from the study. They focused on rhyming words and creating those silly songs. Um, they had everything on the sentence strips and they sang the song normally and then they took the sentence strips away and they had to kind of rebuild each sentence together without seeing that visual of the sentence. They, had, uh, they were told to listen for beginning letter sounds to help them identify unknown words. So like in the word bat, you listen for the buh, and then you can listen for the at at the end. 
Um, after each line was completed, the group used their reading voice to read each line. So that's kind of like, if you're an instrumental person, that's kind of like speaking a rhythm before you go and play it. And so then the students got alphabet cards and working mat, and they were sent to work to create two rhyming words together while discussing word families. So rhyming words together, meaning rhyming words that were based from the song. Uh, then each student built and orally read more rhyming words. Next, each child was assigned a word within the song to substitute with a rhyming word. So if the song said, what they used, what was it, five little monkeys? So five little monkeys jumping out of bed, they would say maybe something like, five little monkeys jumping on a head. Um, they substituted words in the song with different rhyming words. And then they added their new word to the song, and then they all went around and sang their songs with the silly words. So these are just some kind of connections that you can read if you're very interested in, but we've already kind of went over these main points. But um, the main thing that I uh, found from all of these is that um, music and rhythm can allow for um, interdisciplinary exchange in learning while not feeling like learning at all. So obviously those students weren't just sitting at their desks the whole time writing down. They were playing rhythm instruments, they were rearranging the sentences, they were singing with their peers, and that was all part of the learning process compared to just sitting at the desk. Um, also, another main point that was really integral to this is that children are able to become aware of differences in their singing voice and their reading voice and develop sound differentiation. Um, so that's really talking about differences in rhythm between their singing voice and their reading voice. And so a couple of ideas that I thought of how you could use these um, in your classroom after reading the article at the bottom. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can do with rhythm games, uh, write, on di write out different rhythms based on what you're teaching lessons on and have students play individually or in groups. Uh, you can do interactive storytelling, uh, which is really good in a reading classroom. So after reading a book with your class, invite them to create a simple song or melody to accompany the main characters in the story. So if you're reading a story about Jack and Jill going up the hill, obviously there's already a song about that, but the kids won't know that, so you can have them create their own song or something like that. And nursery rhyme charades I thought was really interesting because it incorporates movement. You can lead a discussion about the events in a nursery rhyme, focusing on sequential order, so what order the events happen, and rhyming words, and how those are intertwined. So last group discussion, what are some ways we can integrate rhythm, rhythmic activities into our, into our curriculum? So you can turn at your table and talk. I'll only give you like two minutes. Yeah, I think um, it can kind of go both ways too, or, like using rhythms to like help students remember concepts that aren't music related, then also using like language and like the language that's in a rhythm that help like students remember like a musical concept, like the whole um, I've got rhythm, like you so point phrase, like that whole thing. It's kind of what I think of immediately. But it kind of goes both ways. Um, <laughs> But kind of bringing it back in, um, so what were some of the things that you discussed at your table, if you feel comfortable sharing it? Um, you can plot out syllables and words while you're reading or talking, or you can keep a steady beat while you're speaking in rhythm, so you can feel the beat of that syllable. 
Yes, and the clapping is something a lot of teachers already do just because they can have the students do it along with them and it's good to hear the beat a little louder than if you were just tapping your foot. Um, yeah, anyone else? Um, okay. Can I kick in? Yeah, okay. So you can do as a duty sleep because you make awareness, we talked about earlier in the semester, substitution and deletion or addition kinds of exercises where you um, model or mimic you know, ways to, um, if you, if you listen, but then you take out something that you started, you know, what do you hear? And ask, if, ask children to finish that line or to substitute one rhythmic um, line for another. You know, can they kind of hear it and focus on it? Like that idea of phase locking as part of how the brain perceives sound. So can they actually do that and transform? We do that with language with words all the time. Can they do that with rhythmic sound and words? Yes, and I think that focuses a lot on the pausings between words and letters and sentences, which um, can kind of help with the emotional side of it too. I think. So for review, um, children's ability to produce an accurate beat can be linked to having some strong uh, pre-literacy skills currently and in the future. So obviously all of this is always developing, especially in very young children. So continuing to do this throughout a child's education, even on into high school, can um, create for lots of different skill building that's engaging and teach them more about musical dimensions as they progress throughout their careers in education. And obviously, especially, this will work in reading. So children must, children must learn the basics of both reading and music in order to have a solid understanding of both disciplines. And obviously, we know that music and arts can be engaging, hands-on, and connecting, and a connecting force between all academic disciplines. That's all. Thank you.